Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine. Here's what's coming up on today's program. European stocks follow Asia into the green. Treasury yields tick lower across the curve, while Bitcoin tops $30,000 for the first time since June. President Biden travels to Ireland to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. But talks with allies, including Rishi Sunak, could be overshadowed by a mounting intelligence crisis. Plus, China consumer and producer inflation show ongoing softness in March, bolstering the case for further stimulus. It's an hour into your cash equity trade, and the post-Easter holiday cheer is easily continuing in this market. But how sustainable is it exactly? European equities up half a percent. Almost every sector is in the green this morning, except for food, beverage, and tobacco. So even more of a safety play not doing well, but things like real estate, autos, higher beta sectors, those doing well. That's also reflected in the fact that Bitcoin is above $30,000. But volumes are thin. Trading is thin. So this is moving on perhaps not a clear driver considering some of the turmoil in the sector, but we are up another 3% this morning. German two-year yields, the cash trade in Germany opened for the first time since the long weekend. It has some cash up to do with American jobs report. An American jobs report, which I should say was very middle of the road, but perhaps that was enough to increase some short bets on short-dated treasuries. At least that's what hedge funds did going into the decision. So German two-year yields move higher by nearly eight basis points. Finally, euro versus the dollar. Euro getting some strength. It was all about dollar strength yesterday. The FX market, of course, has been open throughout the holidays. Um, but we are seeing some euro strength, perhaps some nervousness around that China data and what it means for a global inflationary impulse. Perhaps China is not going to contribute too much to that. All right, here's your look at Europe. Most things into the green except the IBEX. IBEX that is lower this morning. Again, for most of these regions, it is the first day of trading this week. So following on from a Wall Street session yesterday was just slowly melted higher. Risk assets moving higher in the face of more warnings gathering around this economy. The IMF is the latest to issue such a warning, saying that the outlook for global economic growth over the next five years is the weakest in more than three decades. The emergency lender is urging nations to avoid economic fragmentation caused by geopolitical tensions and to take steps to boost productivity. Joining me now is Bloomberg's Christine Aquino. Uh, Christine... Again, more recessionary calls, this time from the IMF. Is this one different than perhaps we've heard from others? Well, Danny, for this one, I think what really caught my eye is their expectation for rates to return to the ultra-low levels, right? Because we've kind of, as a market, collectively come to accept the idea that, yes, perhaps rates at the moment might be heading toward that restrictive level, and it might be warranted uh, to see rate cuts down the line. But probably not a return to these ultra level rates era that we've seen over the past decade, but the IMF is calling for exactly that. And I think part of their argument is, of course, due to the fact that there are a lot of aging populations, particularly in the developed world, and they're probably reading it via the um, jobs market impact on the overall economic productivity. Now, bear in mind, though, this is a long-term forecast. This is a matter of decades that they're seeing this playing out, but still very interesting that they're kind of harking back to the ultra-low rates era when and, you know, uh, once the central bank started raising rates, we've kind of all just accepted that we're never going to get back to that. Right. Yeah. Just can you really go back to the old playbook we had? Um, joining Christine and me now also is Janet Mui, head of market analysis um, at RBC Bruin Dolphin. Janet, um, Christine and I were just talking about, again, the, the story that has been for the past year, mounting recessionary calls. Looking at that and, and looking at the really strong Treasury rally we've had to start this year, at what point... Do you want to start buying? Is it too late at this point to join that rally? Hi, uh, good morning, Danny. Thanks for having me. Um, so we do think that uh, Treasury yields will go back up a bit. We think the bond market is short-term overbought at the moment. So the direction of travel for us is that we want to add more to the sovereign bond market, uh, particularly in the U.S. So we're waiting for that moment to come back. We think that it will come back because we think that uh, markets are too optimistic on a few rate cuts uh, this year. We think that the Fed has consistently communicated that you know, they, they won't cut this year. 
And we think that inflation is still a problem. Uh, we can see the you know, labor market is still very tight and core inflation is still very high. So we do think that that moment will come back. And then uh, we think the direction of travel should be we, we should will buy bonds at that point. Is there a particular entry point you're looking for? Um, we're closely watching the market situation. We think that, you know, probably the, the peak of the bond yield may have been passed already. Okay. We have previously added to UK yields because we think the UK economic situation would warrant uh, UK bond yields to go a bit lower than the US. Um, but we, we do think that the uh, US Treasury will come back. But we, we don't particularly have uh, a view on what particular level we're closely watching at the moment. Yeah, so bonds are attractive now. And Christine, maybe equities aren't. We do have Bank of America warning Michael Hartnett saying that investors are too optimistic on rate cuts, not pessimistic enough on recession. We have seen equities be just so resilient this year. Absolutely, Danny. And I think that's part of the hope that has been buoying equities is the fact that, oh, you know, if rate cuts are just around the corner, then that is particularly good for equities in the long run, just because it means that support from central banks is finally coming back to the economic system. But yeah, I think the idea that, you know, yes, rate cuts are eventually going to be good for stocks, but before that, uh, the, the scenario in which uh, rate cuts will be will be needed, I think people aren't necessarily thinking about that at the moment. And I think that's what Bank of America is warning at the moment, is that it will require some kind of economic slowdown, perhaps even a recession, to precipitate those, those rate cuts, which, of course, not going to be a great environment for stocks. Exactly. Not a great environment for corporates. We might get some hints of that, or, or maybe we won't. Janet, how, how are you thinking about this earnings season? Banks kick things off on Friday. Corporates have been resilient. Are we finally going to see some ruptures? Yeah, I think we will start to finally see some of weakness in the corporate sector. Primarily is because of the difficulty to defend the margins, because I think uh, people can't really pay these high prices anymore. Uh, there's a degree of how much you can really squeeze the consumers. And we think that you know, there are tentative signs that demand is slowing, uh, particularly in, say, the PC sector uh, and some other, you know, uh, electronic products mm. primarily. So we think that uh, there will be more questions on the durability of these margins. And I think people, of course, will be asking questions of what the latest banking stress means for, uh, first of all, banks and uh, corporates, credit conditions, etc. So I think there will be lots of question marks. And, you know, of course, it will be a huge focus. Yeah, I think tech's a really interesting one because it has been just a market so concentrated in tech. I think the stat was 20 S&P 500 stocks account for 90% of Wall Street gains so far this year. That's very sort of tech bubble levels of concentration, Christine. How does that end? Well, Danny, yeah, I mean, I think earnings season will be very informative for investors, for sure. And I think what's kind of driven that move, right, is uh, there's been kind of this uh, division between profitless tech and the um, bigger tech sector, right, which I think has been responsible for a lot of that move. And so within the tech space itself, people have kind of carved out, okay, what are the havens and what are the riskier assets, quote unquote. Um, and, and, but it's going to be interesting to see again from the likes of uh, Google, your Alphabet, your, your Facebook, your, your big tech companies, how has the latest turmoil um, fed into their sector? Especially because, you know, we've already been seeing job cuts. We've already been seeing a, a version of the slowdown in the tech sector prior to the broader version that we saw over the last month. And so it's going to be really interesting this earnings season to see what is their outlook moving forward? Are they more pessimistic than the rest of the sectors? Yeah. And again, you you know, we'll, we'll find out in coming weeks. So definitely will be interesting. Thank you both for joining, helping set us up for it. That's Janet Mui, Head of Market Analysis at RBC Brew and & Dolphin, and of course, Bloomberg's Christine Aquino. Coming up on the program, Swiss government officials will meet tomorrow for a special session on using taxpayer money to support UBS taking over Credit Suisse. We'll have a bit of a preview for you next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Less than a month after forcing through the creation of a Swiss banking giant, the country's government is set to be grilled in Parliament this week, starting today. Here with more is Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. Uh, Tom, so what are we expecting from this special session? Yeah, so we're basically expecting a lot of noise, 
but ultimately there's not much that can be done by these lawmakers to change the deal or anything like that. It has been agreed, it's been pushed through through special ordinance. So really it's a chance for those politicians to sort of get out there, get their kind of talking points across. Very, very contentious topic in Switzerland at the moment, so I'm expecting yeah, a lot of sort of fiery speeches. But ultimately, the deal itself is sort of a separate matter and will continue as is. But couldn't it result in, at least down the road, even, I guess, ironically, a breakup? Because I know there's been concerns of concentration in the Swiss banking sector that you just now have this one giant. Yeah, exactly. And that is still an open question. We know UBS are really keen to keep those Swiss operations, you know, in-house, as it were. Uh, but yeah, no, I expect that's going to be one of the big topics. Those politicians coming out and saying, hey, this is doing the Swiss people a disservice. We need to have competition. Why, what's wrong with trying to IPO, let's say, Credit Suisse's Swiss unit? So, yeah, that'll probably be probably the most common topic they bring up. Well, speaking of upswells of, of, of people having an impact, I know in Sweden, after the collapse of SVB, their pension fund came under a, a huge amount of stress. Alexa, uh, Electa, one of the biggest pensions there, because they had big stakes. This morning we learned that the CEO is going to be departing immediately. W was this pretty much inevitable given what happened with their investments? Well, look, the pressure has definitely been building. And so, yeah, they had a terrible set of investments. They were in SVB. They were also in Signature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've lost something like 2 billion uh, euros, I think it was, which is obviously, you know, pension holders are extremely angry about. And the company's been trying to manage it. You know, a few weeks ago you had the CEO effectively apologising. But, you know, the anger's been building and, yeah, that sort of sort of local sort of frustration at how this has happened means, you know, really the CEO ultimately had no choice. In, in terms of other fallout, fall, um, fallouts from the banking sector in the U.S., we're, we're still sort of combing through every piece of data we get when it comes to loans, when it comes to credit, anything like that. I know we got some data out recently uh, yesterday. Are things more calm yet? It does look like that. So this is the data sort of, I think it's known as the lender of second last resort, basically. It's how banks will tap stuff to sort of ensure a bit more liquidity. And that's really dropped. So that's down to sort of much more normal levels. And it's just the latest piece of information out there which suggests, yes, perhaps the sort of the acute phase of this crisis has passed. You had Jamie Dimon saying that was his sense of things. Mm. And it does look like the data is starting to back that up, that at least these, this big volatility in the US banking is, is starting to move. So I guess it's the second order effects now, like a CEO having to leave a pension fund. Exactly. Tom, thank you so much. As always, that's Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. All right, let's now get to your stocks on the move. With that is Joe Easton from our equities team. Joe, what you got for us? That's right, Danny. So we're starting out looking at HelloFresh today. This one jumping after a surprising upgrade over at JP Morgan. They are going overweight, that stock, having only gone underweight just a couple of months ago. They say the fully packaged meal offering is going to make up for some of the lack of demand in the traditional recipe packages that did really well during the pandemic. But a lot of people now cancelling that due to the cost of living crisis. JP Morgan, however, turning a bit more positive. Then I think we're going to bring up on the screen Glencore as well. Now, Glencore is jumping today along with the other miners. This is as, there we go, up on the screen, up 2.8%. This is as the company that it's attempting to buy called Tech over in the US, that's the Canadian firm listed in New York, is pushing back, saying that won't be a good deal. That would have cost Glencore more than $20 billion, and a lot of investors here in London didn't like that agreement at all, so they're a bit relieved that that might not happen, given the Canadian firm is turning a bit hostile on that one. Then I'm going to look at hotels. This one is one for the White Lotus fans, I think. This is the luxury hotel sector. Morgan Stanley really positive on that space this morning in a note saying that luxury hotels globally could reach around $219 billion in annual revenue. That's around 50% of the luxury goods market. So we can see how big that is. And Accor in France would be one of the biggest beneficiaries and potentially see 20% annual growth in their sales, according to Morgan Stanley. Finally, we're going to look at semis. Really wanted to bring this up just because there's been way too much green on the screen today. Got a bit of red finally. This one down 5%. Nordic semis is the worst performing stock in Europe today. They've had a price target downgrade by DNB, which is their corporate broker. And also we've had news of Samsung's weak earnings on Friday and also TSMC over in Taiwan. Those are feeding in. This is a customer of theirs. Bit of negativity, finally, bit of negativity on the screen. As I say, the worst form on the stock 600 is Nordic Semiconductor. Okay, Joe, thank you so much for that. That's Bloomberg's Joe Easton on the stocks on the move.
Coming up, a U.S. intelligence leak poses what the Pentagon calls a serious threat to national security. We have that for you next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's get your first word news now. With that is Leanne Gerens. Good morning, Leanne. Danny, good morning to you. The IMF says the outlook for global growth over the next five years is the weakest in more than three decades. The emergency lender is urging nations to avoid economic fragmentation and to take steps to boost productivity. The IMF's medium-term GDP growth forecast of 3% year compares with 3.8% achieved on average over the past two decades. Now, now, England's health service is set to be hit by a fresh four-day strike by junior doctors. The staff, qualified medics and clinical training want a 35% pay rise after years of below inflation increases. The government says the walkouts risk patient safety and have been timed to maximise disruption, and that's after the Easter break. Now, Jez Staley has been accused of whining by a judge overseeing the litigation surrounding him and his former employer, Jay AP Morgan over his ties to the sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. A U.S. district judge said Staley's argument for more time did not warrant a severance for or a change to the October trial date. Staley says the allegations about him and his connections with Epstein are baseless. And Australia is preparing to host its first senior Chinese official in six years in a sign of warming relations between the two nations. Ties started deteriorating in 2017 after Australia introduced anti-foreign interference laws that Beijing believed targeted China. China describes the visits by its vice a foreign minister as a new round of consultation. China is planning to require a security review of bots like ChatGPT before they are allowed to operate. Providers of the generative AI service must ensure content is accurate and neither discriminates nor endangers security. The draft government guidelines cast uncertainty over the bots unveiled by China's largest tech companies. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thank you very much. The U.S. Justice Department has opened a criminal investigation into the leak of highly classified Pentagon documents, which include information about how the U.S. spies on foreign countries. The Pentagon says the leak poses a very serious risk to national security. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Mark Champion on this. Uh, Mark, first the basics. What, what more do we know about this leak? Uh, well, the first is that we, we know that it was not the kind of leak that we saw, um, you know, via uh, WikiLeaks, uh, uh, where you had um, digitally uh, hacked uh, documents in their tens of thousands. Um, so this is a smaller number of documents. Um, there are photographs taken of them, so it very much suggests that it's a leak by an official. Um, and, uh, but it's nevertheless serious, um, because what it really does is to, uh, you, you know, indicate, uh, first of all, to allies that, yes, the U.S. is still spying on them, as the Snowden uh, controversy uh, suggested some years ago. And, and secondly, uh, it also reveals really uh, quite operative information about the state of the Ukrainian forces in Ukraine, um, their preparations for an offensive, the chances of that happening, and above all, um, the, uh, the, the, the state of their stockpiles of anti-aircraft weapons. And, and as you say, that this is very sensitive, um, especially when it comes to information about sp spying on allies. What have the reactions across the globe been? Um, you know, in public, uh, quite reserved. Uh, in South Korea, there was a very public denial, uh, saying that you know the, these were falsified documents. Mm. Um, however, uh, nobody, you know, sort of behind the scenes, nobody is denying that uh, this is going to cause some problems for the U.S. And the U.S. is already uh, quite uh, heavily engaged in damage control. And then, and then to the other point you made in terms of any, any weaknesses in, Ukraine, in Ukraine's military, what sort of impact could the leak of that information have? 
Well, uh, the real concern is that you know, you know many of these things were kind of suspected or you know uh, talked about by analysts, and of course Russia has its own uh, sources. It's uh, uh, within Ukraine, and uh, so it may have its own intelligence. It's hard to know exactly how much of this will be new to the Russians. Um, however, what it really does do is to say, uh, you know, of Ukraine that they are running out of anti-aircraft weapons, which is absolutely critical. Um, they cannot succeed in a, uh, in a, in a counteroffensive, and they will really struggle uh, to prevent a counteroffensive by the Russians as soon as they have no means of protecting themselves against the Russian Air Force, which has been preserved, uh, having failed at the beginning of the war to you know, uh, get uh, air supremacy. It has been preserved since. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that update. That's Bloomberg's Mark Champion on the Pentagon leak. Now, coming up, the latest Chinese inflation figures suggest a muted economy in March. Could there be more stimulus ahead? This is Bloomberg. European stocks follow Asia into the green. Treasury yields tick lower across the curve, while Bitcoin tops $30,000 for the first time since June. President Biden travels to Ireland to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. But talks with allies, including Rishi Sunak, could be overshadowed by a mounting intelligence crisis. Plus, China consumer and producer inflation show ongoing softness in March, bolstering the case for further stimulus. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Francine Lacroix is off this week. Now, I mentioned that data coming out of China. It showed that consumer inflation slowed in March and producer prices contracted even further. CPI in the year to March was 0.7 percent, weaker than the 1 percent forecast by Bloomberg economists in a survey or survey of economists by Bloomberg. Producer prices fell 2.5 percent over the same period. Here with us in London, a visit over from Hong Kong is Bloomberg Sophia Orta e Costa. Um, Sophia, so with this data, I know globally it had a reaction because perhaps China isn't this big inflationary impulse that we thought it was. Mm -hmm. but, but locally, how did Chinese and Asia markets react to it? Yeah, exactly, Danny. I mean, we saw a little bit uh, of a move um, in the yuan that uh, weakened a little bit because it does bolster the case for more stimulus. Um, and uh, stocks uh, had quite a bid on the back of this. Again, the story meaning the story is that the good, bad data on this front um, bolsters the case for more stimulus. It really gives the PBOC room to um, inject more uh, support into the economy because the PBOC, the central bank in China, is still very much in a wait and see mode. Uh, and what this what this data and what economists are saying when we spoke to them this morning was that really the authorities don't need to do this anymore. Um, you know, you don't have those kind of price pressures that we had here in European economies uh, and in the US. Um, so markets taking this positively is not a kind of a um, you know, it's it, at the end of the day, it still suggests that uh, domestic demand in China remains weak and also exports demand m remains weak. And that's the producer and consumer prices. So there is more work to be done. The, the scope for disappointment is obviously high because if the PBOC doesn't follow through, if Beijing doesn't do anything to bolster growth and continues to wait, then we could get a bit of frustration in markets, Danny. Yeah, because I was going to ask what, what sort of the line is between, OK, we keep policy easy, we don't tighten, we obviously don't need to versus easing further. Does this meet that bar, this type of data? I think, you know, the first quarter was all about the, the economy had just reopened. Let's not forget that China took a lot longer to uh, reopen from or to, to kind of end COVID zero. It was only in December and only really in January after the Lunar New Year holiday holiday that consumers could go out, could go traveling, spend. So it, it really made sense from a, a, a kind of policy point of view to wait and see. Now um, the case is, is weaker for that. The wait and see strategy no longer makes sense. We do get data, GDP data next week. I think that could be a big one. Mm. Uh, also industrial production, retail sales that could 
kind of point us in either direction. And the PBOC, the central bank, has another window to cut interest rates next week. I think it might be a bit too early for the PBOC to do that. It's, it's a, kind of a, a far less aggressive central bank when it comes to policy compared to the Fed, the ECB and the BB, BOE, um, you know, in, in terms of supporting the economy during COVID. So it's likely to maintain that stance. Uh, but in terms of, you know, small stimulus measures like encouraging people to go out and buy more cars, mm. um, you know, adding subsidies that get people out to buy electronics. You know, this is something that can really, when you have a domestic economy the size of China's, this can really kind of move the needle. So yeah. more calls for that. I, I think the news gods might be hearing what you're saying because we just did get some headlines coming out that uh, March aggregate financing in China beating by a really large number, 5,380 yuan. The estimate was 4,500. New loans, a large beat as well. So it kind of goes to what you're speaking as well, sort of getting the domestic economy up and running. Sophia, thank you so much for joining. Uh, that's Bloomberg Sophia Orta e Costa. Now, new BOJ Governor Kazuo Ueda says the use of yield curve control and negative rates are still appropriate for the Japanese economy. At the same time, in elsewhere in Japanese markets, billionaire investor Warren Buffett told the Nikkei he's turning his focus back to Japan. Joining us now to discuss is our Japan economics and government editor, Yuko Takeda. Um, so, uh, so, Yuko, the Ueda era has officially begun. What did we learn from his inaugural presser? Yes, so the um, Uedo uh, era has officially begun as of yesterday, and um, the message we're getting so far is no immediate change, basically. Uh, Ueda said during his inaugural presser that um, the YCC should stay, the negative rates should stay, and um, the BOJ's um, easing bias itself it should stay. So the message we, we're getting from him um, from his first ever presser as BOJ governor is that um, he doesn't plan on any sudden changes here. And uh, uh, it, it strikes a, a big contrast with um, his predecessor, Kuroda, who um, in his first inaugural presser sort of um, came in and said, uh, I'm going to shake things up, I'm going to um, change things. But Ueda so far, um, the message we're getting is that uh, things are going to remain um, the same for now. I wonder how much of this, Yuko, is, is this idea of, of needing consensus first. We know Ueda met with Prime Minister Kishida before the presser to say they'll keep the 2013 joint agreement unchanged for now. What's the significance of that? And, and again, does Ueda need more of a consensus before he can make any changes rather than coming in and, and changing things at the first brush? Right, so, so that 2013 joint agreement um, basically tied the BAJ to easing. Uh, and that messaging from uh, Ueda and Kishida yesterday that they won't change this immediately uh, is another sort of signal that they're not in a rush to change things. Or on um, whether he needs additional backing to change things up, um, you can sort of say that uh, Kuroda before him um, already had the backing of Abe at that time, and that's why he was able to shake thing, things up. Um, so without um, perhaps government backing or government agreement in, in the back, um, at his back, it, it may be difficult for Ueda to completely change things up um, going forward. Now, elsewhere in Japanese markets, Warren Buffett was giving an interview to uh, the Nikkei saying that he's thinking of, of buying more Japanese stocks. We, we saw the reaction immediately as we typically do in, in response to a Buffett comment. But what do we know about what exactly he's looking at buying? Right, he, he wasn't too clear judging from the Nikkei article itself. Um, he's already um, made news saying that uh, he's bought Japanese trading house shares. And in the Nikkei interview itself, uh, it seems like he's added to those holdings. But um, he kept his comments uh, fairly vague in terms of where else he's going to uh, buy. Um, he, the hint was that he's looking to buy more Japanese shares, whether it's more trading house uh, shares or other uh, sectors. But um, looking at the article itself, it, it didn't seem um, quite clear what exactly he's looking to buy. Um, that said, uh, this could be um, a catalyst for more foreign investors to um, buy Japanese uh, shares, particularly those who are, uh, that are undervalued at the moment. Okay, Yuko, thank you so much for joining us. That's Bloomberg's Yuko Takeo in Tokyo. Now, coming up on the program, 25 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, we're going to take a look 
at not just the impact of the treaty, but Biden's agenda when he visits the region this week. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-five years ago, politicians in Belfast signed the Good Friday Agreement, officially ending more than 30 years of conflict in Northern Ireland. Known as the Troubles, around 3,500 people were killed in violence including bombings and rioting. The prospect of peace and a stable devolved government was met with overwhelming support. Tony Blair, Bertie Ahern and Bill Clinton played a key role in helping hammer out the agreement. It was based on power sharing between mostly Catholic nationalists who favoured independence and Protestant unionists wanting to preserve ties with the UK. But the journey hasn't always been smooth and distrust remains along with continued instances of violence. We are dealing with a divided society. We wish it wasn't, but it is. And, you know, you're go it's going to need tender and open care for, for the long time. The Northern Ireland Assembly at Stormont has been unable to function for 40% of its lifespan due to disagreements between the sides. Most recently, the Executive Committee hasn't met since February 2022, Disco spurred in part by post-Brexit trading arrangements. While not suspended, no major decisions can be made. But, despite many continuing challenges, optimism remains. Whatever the problems in Northern Ireland, what people should never forget, it's a world better from where it was. And if we exercise common sense and realism today, we can keep the peace intact. That was Bloomberg's Luis Moon on the historical significance of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, staying on this topic, U.S. President Joe Biden arrives in Belfast tonight for its 25th anniversary, that landmark of the deal. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg's U.K. government reporter Alex Wickham and our Dublin bureau chief Morwenna Coniam. Morwenna, let me start with you. So we know Biden is very proud um, of his Irish heritage, but what is his aim? What is his objective on this visit? Well, ostensibly, I'd say it's two main things. One is it is meant to be a celebration of the Good Friday Agreement, 25 years of you know, predominantly peace in Northern Ireland, which really cannot be underestimated. It is something that a lot of people thought would never happen, um, including very close to 1998 when the deal was signed. It's also an opportunity for him to celebrate his Irish heritage, particularly when he comes to the Republic of Ireland later this week. Um, and he'll be visiting some of his, um, what the counties where his ancestors were from, as well as meeting with the Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varica, where there will be some bilateral talks on issues of common interest. And, and, and get into that a little bit more in terms of, of, of the agenda when he's in the Republic of Ireland. You, you mentioned a few things there, but, but politically, any sort of outcomes that, that the Biden administration is hoping for? Um, I think it's been largely quite closed in terms of the exact agenda there. But one thing is, it again, is celebrating the achievements of the Good Friday Agreement, but also um, reassuring and reminding of the U.S.'s commitment to helping ensure peace and stability across the whole of the island of Ireland, which, um, you know, they were all involved very closely with the negotiations of the Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago. Um, in terms of uh, policy issues, um, you know, there's lots of things in the world at the moment that they have a shared, shared view on. Um, we haven't had too many specifics, although it is understood that they may, the U.S. may want to recognize Ireland's role in enabling the minimum tax uh, deal that the, was signed by the OECD um, in 2021 to come about. Ireland was, he was a huge, played a huge part in that. Um, as well as um, Leo Varica mentioned last week that they might be discussing some cybersecurity issues, um, given particularly there's a lot of big U.S. multinational companies based in Ireland. Alex, let me bring you into the conversation. So that's how things might unfold when it comes to Biden's visit to Ireland. Um, but in some ways, is this also a reset of U.S.-U.K. relations? 
I think certainly the UK government would like it to be uh, that way. Rishi Sunak, the UK Prime Minister, is certainly keen to impress Joe Biden and have a good relationship with Joe Biden. And UK-US relations have been a little bit strained on some areas uh, under the Biden administration, on Brexit uh, in particular. The Northern Ireland issue, which has gone on for years unresolved, this dispute of post-Brexit uh, trading arrangements, finally sort of resolved in the last few weeks by Rishi Sunak's government. And certainly this is something that the Biden administration have been privately lobbying the UK government to, to get over the line, this, this deal on Northern Ireland. So I think Rishi Sunak would absolutely hope that Biden can come and it could be a sort of a bit of a happy moment for all involved uh, and a bit of a sort of a move back towards positive relations. Well, well, given that the trade issue with Northern Ireland, that hurdle has been overcome, what are the prospects for a UK-US trade deal? This is a big question. It's something that the Brexiteers in Britain, Rishi Sunak, of course, one of those, have really wanted a, a, a free trade agreement with the US has been seen as a big prize of Brexit, potentially. However, under the Biden administration, it's just simply been off the table. And I think that remains the case. The Biden administration, not really that interested in, mm -hmm. in FTAs with not just Britain, but, but other countries. It's not really their thing. What Britain does want to do, though, is just restart those trade talks, so not on, towards a full FTA, but towards something approaching that direction, certainly. Um, closer relations for SMEs, things like that. Um, and this is something that has really stalled in the last few months as the Biden administration was pretty upset with some of the UK's hardline rhetoric on Northern Ireland uh, over, over the last year or so. Um, but now that's sort of smoothed over. This is something that uh, Sunak and his team will be lobbying the, the White House team for. Okay. Alex, Morwana, thank you both so much for helping us set up the Biden visit to the region. That's Bloomberg's Alex Wickham and Morwana Kaniam. Now, we're going to be covering all things UK every single week on Thursdays. That's at 9.30 a.m. London time uh, on our half hour special. Coming up, Apple Mac shipments slumped to their lowest since the early 2000s. And the iPhone maker plans to open its first stores in India. All of that for you next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's get your Bloomberg Business Flash now. With that is Leanne Gerrans. Leanne. Hi, Danny. The Confederation of British Industry has named its former chief economist, Rain Newton Smith, as its new director general. Newton Smith will replace Tony Danker, who is dismissed with immediate effect following a probe into workplace misconduct. The CBI board says Danker's conduct fell short of that expected of the director general, but he is not the subject of any of the more recent allegations into a wider investigation. Now, the IMF says the outlook for global growth over the next five years is the weakest in more than three decades. The emergency lender is urging nations to avoid economic fragmentation and to take steps to boost productivity. The IMF's medium-term GDP growth forecast for 3% per year compares with 3.8% achieved on average over the past two decades. Australia is preparing to host its first senior Chinese official in six years in a sign of warming relations between the two nations. Ties started deteriorating in 2017 after Australia introduced anti-foreign interference law that Beijing believed targeted China. China describes the visit by its vice foreign minister as a new round of consultation. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Leanne, thank you very much. Now, Apple's personal computer shipments dropped 40 percent in the first quarter, the worst three-month drop since early 2000. According to International Data uh, Corporation, shipments of all PC makers combined slumped by nearly 30 percent to 56 million units. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Um, Alex, Apple Mac shipments slumping, according to IDC. What's the driver behind this? It's a bit of a perfect storm, really, because you've got a really tough comparison on last year where you had two factors really driving shipments up. Firstly, they had a range of new models, which kind of drives refreshes. You still had people spending money and, importantly, companies spending money on new hardware, you know, in the course of the pandemic as 
there was for some people a little bit more disposable income for companies people working from home that you needed to kit out or they felt they need to kit out with the top stuff that was making things hard on the comparison side then you have at the moment just a really tight economic environment where you know the laptops and Macs are very much a, a discretionary spending item do people need new Macs not necessarily they have a longer lifespan maybe three four five years rather than the two three years you might think of typically with a handset you put all those things together and you end up with this this drop so it's the economic environment but it also maybe to some degree is the geopolitical environment that apple is trying to navigate um, in december there are of course those reports that apple was looking at moving some production away from china and this morning we learned that um, tim cook has said that apple is going to open some of its first stores in india soon is 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 this part of that shift away from China? Well, it is, but maybe not in the way that you would expect. One of the reasons, um, in order to open an own brand store in India, you have to have a certain proportion of the uh, items sold in the store coming from India itself. So the fact that Apple is bringing more production to India may, in fact, help it open stores in the country. Now, clearly, it's not bringing manufacturing there solely so that it, it could open stores. India is, of course, a massive captive market. And I think as far as Apple is concerned, uh, untapped, uh, it's at a stage where China maybe was a few years ago. So it's because they've got more manufacturing there that it's made it easier for them to think about opening stores in the country. Alex, before we let you go, I want to ask you about Tesla because shares fell yesterday. Yet again, Tesla marked down the share, uh, the, the price of the vehicles. And you, have, you and I, every time you come on, we've had this conversation about these tech companies wanting to not follow that model of growth at any cost. Is this Tesla still following growth at any cost? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. When you particularly compare it to, say, Meta, which is saying this is going to be the year of savings when we really knuckle down on cutting costs. Well, Tesla's not necessarily, cut, you know, expanding its costs, but it is taking a bit of a hit to its gross margin by cutting the cost of its, of its um, uh, models. Right. And, uh, you know, it's trying to continue growing unit sales. You could say, on the other hand, it's actually taking share away from other electric car makers who have a higher cost base than Tesla does. Nonetheless, the, the street is forecasting a two to three percentage point hit to the gross margin this year as it expands those cost cuts. Uh, sorry, price cuts, right. I should say. My apologies. It, it, it is a little bit counter to what the rest of the market is doing right mm. now, where it's saying, actually, no, there is some value to be found with us. Tesla could be a company that generates quite a lot of value, does now have, you know, relatively healthy free cash flows. That's something that would get investors in the current climate more excited. The stock has recovered a little bit this year. It is still down something like 50% from its peaks in last year. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting strategy that's counter to what a lot of other people are doing. Right. Yeah, and I guess if share prices can continue to recover, at least hold, maybe it shows that, hey, perhaps being a growth stock, eh, it's okay right now. Well, I mean, you know, it declined yesterday on, those, <laughs> yeah, that's on some true. of this news. So it, it's a slightly risky strategy. Perhaps. Fair enough. Alex, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Later in programming, don't miss our interview. We're going to be speaking with John Bolton, the United States former National Secretary, Security Advisor under former President Donald Trump at 6.40 p.m. London time. This is Bloomberg. We've never seen this much tightening without a recession. There's a lot more resilience in this economy than you thought. Now, I still think you're going to go into a second half recession, but not all recessions are created equal. Even if we don't have a really deep recession, it still means that the stock market's got further to fall. And I think well, there's a very good chance uh, that we'll test and maybe even undercut the, the lows of last October. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Bitcoin goes over $30,000 for the first time since June. It's now up more than 80% this year. The Pentagon warns that those leaked intelligence documents are a threat to security. Prosecutors want to find out who is responsible. 
And there's an early sign that the banking crisis in the United States has started to subside. Meanwhile, New York Fed President John Williams says the central bank's rapid interest rate hikes didn't cause the turmoil. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. We're still talking about whether we will and to what extent see a recession in the United States and in other parts of the world. Matt, the focus this week, though, could really be on that inflation data out of the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to that data uh, to determine what the Fed is going to do. I think the consensus is pretty strong that we're going to have a recession here in the U.S. in the next couple of quarters. Take a look at what's going on in stocks. It hasn't affected futures. We're still up after a positive close on the S&P 500 in the cash trade yesterday. Only two-tenths of a percent gain, but you're seeing rates continue to come down. The two-year under 4%. The 10-year now under 340 at 338.68, and that gives a little bit of a tailwind to stocks. NYMEX crude has been holding at $80 essentially since last Monday after the surprise cut by OPEC. Um, and it hasn't moved much out of that range. NYMEX around 80, Brent around 85. It seems to be um, fairly stable. Bitcoin had been fairly stable at around 27, 28,000 for a while. It's now jumped up over $30,000. Uh, for the first time since June. So the digital asset at $30,104.82, something we're going to be talking about a lot more throughout the day because it definitely moves markets in terms of anything related to crypto up, regardless of the other news on, for example, Coinbase or Block. If they've been downgraded by analysts yesterday, it doesn't matter. They're gaining 2 or 3% in the pre-market uh, today. In terms of what's going on in Asia, that's where a lot of the optimism has come through. He had a gain on the broader MSCI Asia Pacific index. Also, the Hang Seng closed up three quarters of 1%, and the Nikkei up a little bit more than 1% on some uh, dovish words from UADA. That hasn't given any uh, 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 weakness to the yen. It did for a minute see the yen drop, but then the yen heads uh, after that um, strengthened against the U.S. dollar. Here you see the dollar can now buy 133.09 yen. Anna, what do you see in Europe? Yeah, plenty of conversations through the Asia session then about what UADA means at the BOJ and the markets reacting to that. Here in Europe then, Matt, we see positivity in the main across European equity markets. Of course, we've been closed for the last couple of, uh, of, of global work days, if you like, Friday and into Monday. So uh, a first time to react to some of the data that we got out for the United States on Friday today for European equity markets. Uh, the IBEX weighed down by Iberdrola, a substantial weight to the downside on that particular market today. But here's what we see at the upside. Basic resources, the mining sector, the best performing sector across Europe today and really underscoring the risk on mood that we're seeing here for European stocks up by 2.8 percent today. Here's a chip making business in Europe and uh, despite the fact that this business actually downgraded its expectations for what it thinks it can deliver and some analysts followed suit, some analysts flagged that that had been well foreseen and the risk on mood seems to be overtaking those individual concerns and Soytech up by 7.7 percent along with the rest of the chip making sector. The pound is at 124.43 so up by half a percent weakness in the dollar really perhaps the story here because we see the pound gaining we also see the euro gaining but interesting that we are seeing traders increasingly betting or uh, increasingly betting on higher rates from the bank of england now up to 4.7 percent or so by the month of september i think in terms of their estimates and the german two-year yield i put in here uh, the german two-year but i could have picked almost any contract across europe to show you the uh, the difference we're seeing here in europe versus the united states so here in europe we are seeing yields on the rise at the short end and the longer end across all kinds of geographies in Europe and this because of a day's catch up because we were closed yesterday so the market's having their first chance to react to what we saw on payrolls and, and to everything else we missed out on over the last couple of days Matt. All right well one of the things uh, we haven't missed out on is the rally in Bitcoin we've been watching it very closely take a look at the token right now trading above $30,000 for the first time since June of last year Bloomberg senior crypto reporter Ana Herrera joins us now to talk about this so Anna, what's, what's behind the rally? What does this say about, or if anything, what's going on in the industry? I guess what's really surprising for, for anyone who's watching, like a casual observer, because the industry keeps having crises and like funding for startups hasn't gone up. Uh, but at the same time, the price is rallying more than any other asset class. And, and partly, I guess, this is because, again, this is a play uh, against sort of inflation and the idea that perhaps interest rate, rate hikes are over. So people are betting uh, against that. And so perhaps that, that's the reason. But you never know with Bitcoin, obviously.
OK, yeah, you never know for sure, but it could be linked into the Fed conversation, as you point out then, Anna. Uh, before we saw this resurgence in Bitcoin, we were talking a lot about a year-long crypto winter and a market downturn. And that has meant that some people have been uh, having to support their businesses in the crypto space. And I'm thinking here of the Winklevoss twins. What do we make of the latest moves here? Yeah, they had to lend $100 million. We had a scoop. They had to lend $100 million to their own platform, Gemini, which, of course, was embroiled in a lot of the crisis last year. They were one of the partners of Genesis, which went bankrupt and so they had to come in and, and we heard that they had been trying to raise but weren't able to and that kind of speaks to what I was saying before the fact that startups have been struggling to raise and VC I think funding is down 80 percent in crypto which is a lot so there's a big contrast between Bitcoin's price and, and the, the industry's sort of sentiment but of course as we always say you know Bitcoin supporters will say one thing is Bitcoin and the rest is the industry and Bitcoin is its own thing. All right, Anna, thanks very much. Anna Herrera talking to us about crypto. You can catch our program that focuses on crypto today at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. Bloomberg Crypto is our weekly show that covers the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. And our guest today includes Fred Thiel, the CEO of Marathon Digital, the crypto miner. Let's get... Uh, to some geopolitical news, the Pentagon says leaked documents that detail U.S. spying on other countries pose a risk to our national security. The Pentagon is conducting a damage assessment. Meanwhile, the Justice Department is trying to figure out who leaked those documents. Joining us to discuss is Mark Champion, Bloomberg senior reporter for international affairs. And Mark, the, the U.S. leak seems to have rattled both the Pentagon and Ukraine with some obviously very sensitive information, but some of it looks doctored. So how do we know what we can trust? Well, we don't know exactly what we can trust. Um, you know, I think in sort of or order of priority, the, the first thing is uh, it's sensitive just because uh, there were leaks uh, that seem to show that the U.S. is uh, spying on allies, something that, you know, is known. Um, but generally kept sort of, uh, you know, below the radar. As soon as that becomes a diplomatic issue, it is a diplomatic issue. So um, that is an immediate pr uh, problem. A second one is that we don't know exactly whether this is the extent of the leak or whether there is more to come. Uh, and, you know, this can be quite mischievous uh, if uh, generally accurate documents are then doctored because it becomes very difficult to sort of fight that in the, um, in the Twitter sphere, on social media, um, and to sort of control uh, damage. Um, and, you know, the last thing is what was in them. Um, and that was sort of specific to the Ukraine conflict. And it really, uh, you know, gave confirmation, if you like, uh, to, or appeared to, uh, to the uh, Pentagon's concerns that the Ukraine may be, Ukrainians may be running out of anti-aircraft weaponry, uh, which would be an absolutely critical uh, issue for the war. Mm, yes, yeah, so that's the Ukraine side and what the leaks said or might have said about that subject. At the same time then, Mark, we are seeing that the US and Philippines are holding their biggest joint military exercises in decades just after China held a mock invasion of Taiwan. Are we seeing some kind of escalation here? Uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's, you know, these things are very hard to, uh, you know, to interpret exactly. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, no denying uh, that, you know, one of the things that the U.S. has done uh, with the Philippines that the Chinese will be concerned about um, is that there are yet some new bases that the Americans would be able to use, um, which would be closer to Taiwan. And what the Chinese were trying to demonstrate with their effort uh, was to show that, you know, it would be very, very difficult for the uh, U.S. to counter uh, a Chinese effort to isolate Taiwan militarily. Uh, so this is, in, you know, will be looked at as a kind of uh, response, um, uh, an indication that the, the U.S., do, you know, does have some of the facilities that would be needed to do that or more than, the, you know, that it did have before. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, yes, it does. And I think what uh, you know, we have to bear in mind is that the lesson of the war in Ukraine is that, um, you know, conflicts that seem irrational, um, you know, and uh, unlikely uh, can take place. Uh, and the more that you see these kinds of ex exercises, the more that there will be uh, reason for concern. 
Mark, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Mark Champion with the latest on those geopolitical developments. Let's get back to the markets. New York Fed President John Williams is rejecting the idea that the Fed's rapid interest rate hikes led to problems in the banking industry. Let's bring in our markets reporter, Valerie Titel. Uh, Valerie, what were the major takeaways then from this speech from Williams? Look, Anna, this is now the third Fed member who is mentioning that they're not swayed by the recent banking crisis when it comes to hiking rates. He said this late yesterday that he personally doesn't think it was the case that the pace of rate increases was really behind those banking issues. He instead called them idiosyncratic specific issues when it comes to, that pro to the problems with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. He then went on to talk about credit conditions. He said, we have not yet seen any clear signs of credit conditions tightening. He, when he's talking about this, he's saying it is yet to show up in that hard data, hard data like consumer spending and employment, but it is starting to show up somewhat in the softer survey data. This is from the New York Fed research team. It was released late last night, showing that the share of households reporting that credit conditions are harder to obtain versus a year ago hit a peak. This is the highest this has ever been. The survey has been uh, taken place in the 10-year history, but nearly 60% of households are saying that the access to credit has deteriorated from a year ago. That's a credit crunch. Listen, data from last week showed federal home loan bank issuance plunged. Does that mean the dash for cash is over for U.S. banks and uh, maybe the concerns have subsided now? Look, it's a big hint that it might be uh, the, the case for now. The issuance last week fell to $37 billion. That comes after just two weeks ago, uh, an issuance of $304 billion, which was a record for the FHLB. These are early signs that the, the credit, um, sorry, the rush for cash is easing. We actually saw in the Fed's data from Friday that the, the cash reserves that small U.S. banks uh, buffered within those deposit outflows flows ease somewhat. They release some of that cash from their balance sheet. This is again another hint that these small banks are less worried about deposit flow extending. All right, Valerie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel talking to us about the latest Fed speak and what we can take out of the FHLB data that we got yesterday. Let's take a look at some of the stocks that we expect to move in the market today. Uh, Weight Watchers International is one that's up almost 18% in the pre-market. It was raised to a buy at Goldman Sachs after completing its pur purchase of Sequence, which is a subscription telehealth platform offering access to healthcare providers specializing in chronic weight management. That's a long description, so hopefully they can change that to uh, sound better for marketing purposes. Take a look at some of the crypto stocks uh, moving today. Uh, no matter what kind of news you've got out, and you can add to this block and Coinbase, um, even if you had bad earnings or analysts downgraded your stock, they're still up today because of the jump in Bitcoin. Over $30,000 again for the first time since last June in 2022. So Riot, Marathon, and Bit Digital all gainers today, and we're going to talk to the CEO of Marathon Holdings on our uh, Bloomberg Crypto program at 1 p.m. today. And then Tilray is falling after the Canadian cannabis producer reported net revenue that missed the average analyst estimate. And it's not great, right? Because weed sales were already expected to drop below what they were last year. And then the actual printed number was even worse than that. They make more money on distribution as well as beverages and other kind of wellness things. Um, but this is no bueno for Tilray brands. Uh, and as a result, the stock is down 7.3% in the pre-market. Anna? Coming up on the program then, Matt, we'll get back to the macro. We'll talk about where the economy is going from here. Simon French joins us, chief economist at Pan Muir Gordon. We'll get his take on the U.S. and the U.K. perhaps. And we'll also speak to Tatiana Grail Castro, co-head of public markets at Musinish. What is she thinking about real estate, commercial real estate in particular, and what is the outlook for broader credit markets? This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York alongside Anna Edwards in London. And we're looking once again at the volatility in bond markets. That's the white line here compared to um, the lack thereof in stock markets, or at least the perceived lack of volatility for those um, old enough to continue looking at the VIX. Um, it's the move index that I think is the more interesting. The bond market volatility shot up during the SVB and signature bank uh, crises and has now come back down by about a quarter, but is still uh, relatively high. In fact, still holding at the same levels that we saw essentially in March of 2020. Joining us now is Bloomberg credit reporter Priscilla Azevedo Rocha to talk to us about this volatility and what's causing it, Priscilla, um, and, and will it come back down? Hi, Matt. Uh, so uh, what is causing this volatility is this perception that funding markets, they're getting distressed, even if there is not there is nothing like fundamentally wrong with markets per se, is that during COVID, a lot of companies had a lot of government support, they kept afloat. And now, since with the withdrawal of the support, then the maturity wall of many of those companies' bonds coming to an end, they're starting to feel the distress. Mm, yes, and certainly in Europe, we, we might see that with European businesses issuing debt that was then bought up by the ECB due to times of crisis, and now they're not, you know, they're not the buyer anymore. So is the market open for everyone then, Priscilla, or, or are investors just much more discerning now? So the market as a whole is open, but investors have become way more discerning. So now... Uh, uh, issuing debt has become way more expensive than it was only a few months ago, especially after the banking crisis. Companies and public sector issuers, they still have a lot of access to funding markets, albeit at higher prices, but banks have mostly been absent since the last, uh, since uh, the terrible March that we had. Mm, and so if banks are absent, what does that mean for the economy? That means that getting access to funding is becoming more and more expensive. If banks have less lines of credit in bond markets, it means that they can raise less money. Therefore, when they are, that decreases, that shrinks their own lending activities. So for the general retail corporates, it becomes hard, uh, harder to access funding. Mm, so if the banks can't raise, they yeah. can't then uh, offer, offer good rates to others. Yeah, okay, that's Priscilla, right. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Priscilla Azevedo Rocha with the latest on the credit markets. For more market analysis on credit and much more beyond, on, check out the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date, with news from around the world, here's the first word. A fifth person has died in the shooting at a bank in Louisville, Kentucky. The attack was blamed on a 25-year-old employee of the bank who was killed in a shootout with police. Police say the shooter was live streaming during the attack. In North Korea, Kim Jong-un has called for what were described as practical and offensive war capabilities. That came as Pyongyang cut off communication links with South Korea used to reduce tensions on their border. This year, North Korea has tested new weapons and systems to deliver nuclear strikes against the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. In England, the state-run health service is bracing for its most disruptive strike yet. Tens of thousands of junior doctors walked off the job today for 96 hours. They're joining other public sector workers who are demanding bigger pay hikes to make up for inflation. And Warren Buffett is turning his focus back to Japan. Berkshire Hathaway has kicked off a yen bond sale, and Buffett told Nikkei he plans to boost his investment in the country. Shares of Japan's major trading houses jumped after Buffett said he's raised his holdings in them. Meanwhile, in Switzerland, Parliament will question the government today about its role in forcing through UBS's takeover of Credit Suisse. The government agreed to provide up to $120 billion in taxpayer money to support the deal. Lawmakers may be unhappy, but authorities say there's not really much they can do to stop the takeover. And in Sweden, Elekta's CEO was forced to step down after Sweden's biggest pension fund became one of the largest overseas casualties of the meltdown at U.S. banks. And uh, this pension fund, Electa, invested in Silicon Valley Bank as, as well mm. as Signature Bank and First Republic.
quite a ways from yes. home in some pretty risky, it turns out, in hindsight, investments. Yes, quite away from home is an interesting uh, point to mention there because uh, I understand that they put the equity portfolio manager on leave and they said they, they would scale back large stakes in companies, quote, far away from home. So that would be an interesting outcome if this leads to more home bias when it comes to investment strategy. We'll talk about macro assumptions, though. Simon French joins us shortly, chief economist at Pamela Gordon. We'll talk about his outlook for the U.S. economy and here in Europe. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Bitcoin goes over $30,000 for the first time since June. It's now up more than 80% this year. The Pentagon warns that those leaked intelligence documents are a threat to security. Prosecutors want to find out who is responsible. And there's an early sign that the banking crisis in the United States has started to subside. Meanwhile, New York Fed President John Williams says the central bank's rapid interest rate hikes didn't cause the recent turmoil. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, the focus for markets in terms of data last week was on jobs. This week is going to be around inflation in the United States. Uh, but we're playing catch up here in Europe. I see U.S. futures point a little higher this morning. Yeah, U.S. futures, I think, are buoyed somewhat by the positive finish that we had in Asia overnight. Take a look at what's going on right now, about a quarter of a percent after we closed just slightly higher on the S&P 500 in the cash trade yesterday. Also getting a little bit of a tailwind from lower rates really across the curve. We saw the two year come down below 4%. The 10 year yield is down below 340 right now at 338.87. So this offers less competition to stocks. And you don't really see a big surge in commodities. We may have worried a week ago that we would see oil um, taking off after the surprise cut by OPEC Plus, but it really hasn't moved much after the $5 gain that it got, both in terms of WTI and Brent. Right now at $80.34, just up about three quarters of 1%. We do see Bitcoin moving up over $30,000. It continues to rise ever since um, the drop in the wake of the FTX collapse, but it's much higher now than the $16,000 it was trading at um, the day before Sam Bankman-Fried's firm failed right now at $30,085. That's the highest we've seen it since June of last year. In terms of pre-market movers, there is actually a lot going on. Weight Watchers was raised to a buy at Goldman Sachs after completing its purchase of sequence. You've got a ton of, uh, well, let's say all of the um, blockchain related or crypto related stocks gaining. Marathon Digital is one we highlighted here up three and a half percent because we're going to be interviewing the CEO on the Bloomberg Crypto uh, program today. Fred Teal joins us. Tilray Brands is the weed seller out of Canada that missed its revenue estimates, the street's revenue estimates, I should say, and actually saw a decline in sales year over year. What's going on out there? Um, it, it, that's the weed portion of it. They also have a big uh, amount of revenue, even bigger from distribution and then some from beverages and some from other wellness uh, issues. But um, it's down 7 percent in the pre-market. And Newmont Mining is down a little bit more than 2 percent right now. Even as gold rises, um, the U.S. producer has made a fresh bid for its Australian rival, New Crest Mining, sweetening its record offer to $19.5 billion to bring closer the prospect of a precious metal behemoth. Is it behemoth? Be How do you say it in England? Be behemoth? <laughs> I don't know. I just never say that word. Giant is how I say it. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. If in doubt, if in doubt, find, a, find an alternative. Uh, stocks Europe 600 up by six tenths of 1%. Interesting what you were saying there about the mining stocks, though, and the M&A you're seeing there, because that caused one stock to move in the opposite direction to others in the mining space there, Matt. We've got basic resource stocks up by 2.7% uh, today, just underscoring the risk-on mood that we seem to be in as we return from an extended weekend here in Europe. So after a couple of days out from trading uh, where other global markets may 
may have or may not have been open. Uh, we play catch up here in Europe and we're up by 2.7 percent on base, uh, on mining stocks and up broadly around stocks as well. The pound is at 124.44, up half a percent against the dollar. Maybe it's dollar weakness more broadly that we're talking about here, though, because the euro is also stronger. Interesting that the market is increasingly uh, pushing higher expectations of where rates go here in the UK with that uh, inflation rate still running double digits. Uh, the German two year yield I put in here just to show you the catch up story that's happening in uh, bond markets because Treasury's moving in one direction, bond markets in Europe moving in a different direction, and we see those yields going higher here in Europe. We're playing catch up because, of course, this is the first time that European equity markets or, or sorry, bond markets get to react to that jobs report that we saw out uh, during Friday's session, Matt. All right, let's talk about the macroeconomic picture right now with Simon French. He's the chief economist at Panmure Gordon. And Simon, I think it's interesting that today we're seeing continued dollar weakness um, as, you know, consensus seems to be pulled forward on a U.S. recession, maybe a global recession, and then strength in gold over $2,000, strength in Bitcoin over $30,000. What do you make of um, the way the market is pricing these assets? Well, I'm liking the fact that you pick up the, the gold market story. I think that's an area where, look, the headlines on banking fallout, real estate fallout have waxed and then waned, but we expect them to wax again. And in that environment, gold is telling you, and I think it's the right investment hedge in that scenario, that this is not going to be the immaculate deflation story that we had at the very start of Q1. There are going to be failures in both the banking sphere, the real estate sphere, and as a suite of assets across the global economy reprice themselves to a risk-free rate that looks very different. So I think the market is trying to tell you that. It never tells you these things in a straight line, in a linear fashion. Mm. But there are enough indications within there that this is not going to be a, a gradual recovery to something looking like normal. Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, very good to see you, Simon. And I want to understand what normal will look like when we uh, see a little uh, more of a settled picture yep. when it comes to global interest rates and global inflation. Mm. The IMF talking about how the neutral rate might fall back down to these really low levels of, uh, 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 of rates that we saw yep. over decades that we knew and loved, perhaps, yep. or didn't, depending on positioning. But uh, that, that was a story that maybe some economists think we've left behind. So what's the, what's the debate there? Well, the IMF blog that you're referring to, this is talking about the natural rate of interest that is, has been driven lower by demographic change around the world. And quite clear in the IMF analysis is that the two fastest growing major economies, China and India, are going to see the same pathway over the next two to three decades that the developed markets have seen in the last two to three decades. And, and that is interesting from a, from a fixed income perspective. I'm not sure it feeds a lot into the current debate over where the risk-free rate goes from here. But to, your, to the opening part of your question, what does normal look like? Well, I think if we'd been having this conversation of how the economy, the global economy, would respond to higher risk-free rates, if we were having it 12 months ago, we'd say, well, the labour market will weaken. That will be the stated objective of central banks. Is the interpretation, it's certainly my interpretation, uh, 12 months on, that actually labour markets are far more resilient to a higher risk-free rate than we thought? And actually, when we're talking about demand destruction, it's principally through capital and the allocation of capital and the repricing of capital rather than actually the challenges in terms of labour demand from employers. OK, so that's the way that the, the market, the labour market has maybe been resilient. Mm. Do you see cracks emerging? We had an interesting story out this morning in a UK context that, mm -hmm. that talked about a, a very uh, a sort of very monetarist uh, e economic approach, I suppose, and looking at the, uh, the money supply and certain economists <coughs> flagging this as really worrying, saying we've gone too far, look at the way that the money supply has fallen off a cliff and that really tells you that something you know bad is looming where, where, where do you stand on that kind of uh, debate at the moment for the UK yeah well the first thing to say is give the monetarist economists who've been under a lot of pressure for two or three decades <laughs> give them their credit because they flagged the uh, ignorance or the ignoring of monetary aggregates among central banks during the COVID recovery as a real red flag that inflation was coming. And that was largely dismissed by the New Keynesians who tend to dominate central banks and indeed the independent economics community, and I put my hand up in that regard. They, they got it right on the way up. The question is, of course, for an investor to be valuable, for this insight to be valuable, it's got to be right on the way down. And they are right to say the monetary aggregates really around the world 
are now slowing at a very rapid rate and there's a fear of an undershoot in terms of inflation. I don't actually see that, even though the monetary aggregates are pointing that, that in that direction. Why? Because there's quite a lot of pent-up pricing pass-through. It's quite a mm. mouthful to come out with at this time. <laughs> that's still to come through in the way in the wages story. That I think will mean that inflation will remain quite persistent, even as those monetary aggregates start to come back towards low single digits. So Simon, you don't expect us to get back to ZERP or NERP in the next few years? <sighs> no, I don't. And. and this is where that IMF blog has, if you like, triggered that debate again. It's talked about the, the fact that these structural forces from demographics, from financial uh, intermediation, lots of debt dynamics as well, distribution dynamics, are pointing towards closer to ZERP. But we have to get there, and that's the key part of getting there. You know, these... The narrative adjusts almost instantaneously. A lot of prices in capital markets in, uh, adjust almost instantaneously. The economy doesn't operate like that. Bargaining doesn't operate like that. And in my view, the, bargain, uh, the bargaining between workers and employers still has a lot of flux still to come through. Yeah, and watching that, uh, the labour market developments then seem to still be key. Simon, thank you very much. Simon French of Panmuel Gordon joining us to talk about the global economy. Coming up, we'll talk about global credit. Tatiana Grell Castro joins us, co-head of public markets at Muse Emission Co. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with the IMS Chief Economist. That's at 10.30 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now, almost one and a half trillion dollars of U.S. commercial real estate debt comes due for repayment before the end of 2025. And the big question facing those borrowers is who's going to lend to them? And I guess the follow on is at what rate? Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg Simone Foxman. So uh, what exactly does this wall of debt look like? I'm assuming um, the rates are so much lower on this than they will be on any debt that's rolled over. Absolutely. So this is the result of a calculation by Morgan Stanley's James Egan, who points out that there are four and a half trillion dollars worth of commercial real estate debt and about 1.5 trillion of that is due before the end of 2025. Especially poor sentiment in things like retail and offices where he expects the valuation likely to fall about 40 percent from peak. But this is disproportionately held by regional lenders who've seen their their own cost of funding rise 50 to 60 basis points just in March alone. So then the question becomes, if they can't lend to this commercial real estate uh, issuers, who will potentially private credit? But of course, at what rate? That remains to be determined. Mm. So if smaller banks then, Simone, have pushed into this commercial real estate lending space, how much of a concern is the recent bank stress that we've seen very much focused around those sm smaller banks? Well, you know, this regional bank stress is really serves to exacerbate an existing problem. Back in January, before we saw all these concerns with Silicon Valley Bank, et cetera, there was $175 billion of commercial real estate trading at distressed levels. And part of this is because we've seen the sentiment around commercial real estate change. You know, we saw people stuck at home during COVID-19. They bought more stuff online. They increasingly don't want to go back to the office. And Cushman Wakefield believes that we could see 330 million square feet of excess office space in the U.S. alone, these problems also spreading to Europe. Now, the good news is that after the global financial crisis, less of this, less of the bad debt anyway, is going to be held by banks. But then again, you know, how much of this is held by family offices? That's something Ben Emmons at New Edge points out. And of course, you know, if these commercial real estate issuers struggle, then that has knock-on effects on jobs, on the global economy.
All right, Simone, thanks very much, Simone Foxman, uh, coming in to do that report for us. We're going to be talking about this issue certainly for months to come. Joining us now is Tatiana Grail Castro, co head of public markets at Muzini. And Tatiana, you know, how much of this issue, you know, the bigger issue that so much debt needs to be rolled over from, you know, near zero interest rates to, you know, six or seven or eight or nine percent. How much of that is a concern to you? It is a concern. And um, um, I, I think the other thing that we need to point out here is actually uh, we have to look at it quite differentiated. So, yes, it is a concern and it is a concern uh, in the U.S., for different reasons than it is a concern in Europe. I think that's something that also needs to be highlighted. So in the US, uh, as you pointed out, regional banks are big lenders, uh, CMBS, so structured uh, credit are, are big lenders. In Europe, it is um, actually the dynamic has been quite different over the last few years. So since 2016, roughly, um, more and more real estate companies came to the capital markets to fund themselves. So that means that they didn't have to offer security many times. They also issued perps. So uh, it's a completely different borrowing structure in the US and in Europe, but both sides have issues. So, um, and, and it's all about uh, refinancing and how the refinancing will take place. And some of the solutions will depend on who the borrower is today to see what financing solutions we can find uh, going forward. In terms of uh, central bank, the role that central banks play, obviously bringing rates up so uh, high so quickly, do you see the possibility of a pause or a turnaround now, a pivot? So yes, for us, uh, we see that um, uh, you know clearly last year um, rates were a headwind, both because they went higher, but also because of the uh, uh, very high volatility. It's very difficult to price uh, credit if interest rates are so volatile. Um, we now see uh, rates having broadly found a band. So yes, there could still be volatility within that band, but uh, I, I, uh, we definitely see that pretty much the rate rises are, are, are behind us. Yes, marginally, we may see another 25 or 50, but it's broadly behind us. And then clearly the next is, uh, will there be rate cuts as early as this year? Um, mm. But we see that there would be a potential now from rates turning from headwinds into tailwinds with maybe some volatility. And really it is credit risk. Uh, you know, real estate would be one sector that is uh, quite exposed to credit risk. But more broadly, we see credit risk be do, to be the one that um, we have to really uh, pay a lot of attention to. Yeah, Tatiana, uh, uh, good morning. We heard from our credit reporter earlier on that uh, capital markets are open to companies that want to borrow, but they're much more discerning than maybe they were when rates were a lot lower. So which are the companies and the types of businesses that you see running into difficulties, especially as you were describing the way that European real estate businesses have relied much more on those capital markets to fund themselves? Yes, exactly. So the focus is always very much on uh, U.S. real estate and commercial real estate and, um, and their connection with the banks. Uh, in Europe, uh, we definitely need to add to that the um, uh, uh, sort of the capital markets. So are capital markets open for them? And that is also the case more broadly. So we talk about uh, financial market conditioning tightening with regards to bank lending standards, but we also see capital markets to be far more discerning, as you say, and as it was uh, explained previously. So where we definitely see, especially the weaker rated businesses, already last year, there was a huge decline in um, um, the issuance within high yield loans. And we continue to see that that hasn't really properly reopened uh, in 2023 either. And to the extent that um, maturities are coming up, and we're not talking 23, 24, but 25 maturities, um, and those companies really need a long window to refinance so that the macroeconomy is there for them to refinance, their own earnings mm. profile is there for them to refinance. So um, it is really the weaker rated companies, the more highly levered companies, the company came with huge uh, EBDA adjustments that never really started to uh, materialize those, those higher EBDAs that, uh, you know, that they had promised investors. Um, and then clearly also certain sectors in, in real estate would be one.
Tatiana, thank you very much. Thanks for the analysis. Tatiana Grell Castro joining us there from Musinish. Uh, coming up on the programme, Biden heads to Belfast to mark 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement. More on the US president's trip next. This is Bling Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. US President Joe Biden arrives in Belfast in Northern Ireland tonight. He'll be there to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Bloomberg's uh, Louise Moon uh, filed this report on the history of the accord. Twenty-five years ago, politicians in Belfast signed the Good Friday Agreement officially ending more than 30 years of conflict in Northern Ireland. Known as the Troubles, around 3,500 people were killed in violence including bombings and rioting. The prospect of peace and a stable devolved government was met with overwhelming support. Tony Blair, Bertie Ahern and Bill Clinton played a key role in helping hammer out the agreement. It was based on power sharing between mostly Catholic nationalists who favoured independence and Protestant unionists wanting to preserve ties with the UK. But the journey hasn't always been smooth and distrust remains along with continued instances of violence. We are dealing with a divided society. We wish it wasn't, but it is. And, you know, you're go it's going to need tender and open care for, for a long time. The Northern Ireland Assembly at Stormont has been unable to function for 40% of its lifespan due to disagreements between the sides. Most recently, the Executive Committee hasn't met since February 2022, discourse spurred in part by post-Brexit trading arrangements. While not suspended, no major decisions can be made. But, despite many continuing challenges, optimism remains. Whatever the problems in Northern Ireland, what people should never forget, it's a world better than where it was. And if we exercise common sense and realism today, we can keep the peace intact. And so, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, we uh, wait for President Biden to arrive in uh, in Northern Ireland and then he's also going to be going to the Republic of Ireland. And Biden will be the eighth sitting US president to visit Ireland. It's a thing that many presidents choose to do. I wonder, uh, the, the main question for me is where does the border go, right? If you're not going to put it in the North Sea, do you put a border between Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? Uh, and wouldn't that cause mm. problems? Well, the, the Windsor framework is supposed to be this big compromise that has played out politically pretty well for Rishi Sunak, although it hasn't got power sharing back in place in Northern Ireland. So that's going to be a big focus uh, whilst President Biden is in the area, thinking about how the, the, the policy-making machine, if you like, actually functions in Northern Ireland. It was set in place with great fanfare 25 years ago, but is it actually working on the ground will be uh, something that will be much discussed, I'm sure. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. They'll be hearing from John Bolton, former U.S. National Security Advisor. Among others. This is Bloomberg.